Greetings, gentlemen. This story truly deserves a movie adaptation. Whether it happened in real life or not, I don't know. You listen to it and decide for yourselves. Let's get started. I was hoping to tell you in a more unique or elegant manner about how I discovered my wife's infidelity. But alas, it was a banal and mundane discovery. As an employee of an auto parts company specializing in the manufacture of brakes, I am one of those lucky enough to fulfill this duty. Every day from 4 to midnight, 5 days a week, I spend 8 hours at an outdated machine. Wearing protective glasses and earplugs, I faithfully perform my duties. Wearing steel-toed boots and a denim apron, I consistently meet my daily quota at work. If I'm lucky, I get a bonus at the end of the year. I have a cozy three-bedroom house, a wonderful wife and two young sons who are in elementary school. After 12 years of marriage, everything seemed to be going well until today. We have five stations where we collect shoes, and all of them work on compressed air. In the eight years that I have been working here, we have never encountered problems with the operation of the equipment. But today, in the middle of the shift, the compressed air supply system suddenly froze. Perfectly dry air is required for the efficient operation of all our machines. This air is filtered and dewatered by reliable automatic equipment, with rare exceptions. Unfortunately, tonight the dehydrator system malfunctioned and could not release the collected moisture. Not being a scientist, I can only assume that when moisture mixes with high-pressure air, it freezes and everything stops working. Instead of waiting for a solution to the problem, the entire team was sent home without a salary. It seems that my life has been greatly affected by increased humidity. When I opened the bedroom door, I saw a big hairy back bouncing up and down on my wife Marcy. Quickly realizing that Marcy was awake, I turned on the overhead light. Damn it, Danny! What are you doing at home? I expected Marcy to be scared and apologize, but instead she was furious. What happened? I asked. Oh, stop being a jerk. You know exactly what's going on. I'm sorry you had to see this. If you had returned home on time, none of this would have happened. He wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't have run into him. His hairy back turned and he looked at me with a grin. Marcy awkwardly pulled up the covers, trying to maintain some modesty. My mistake was that I reached out to grab it. When he got out of bed, his size became obvious. Instead of striking, I received two brutal blows to the ribs and ended up on the floor. I could hardly breathe, feeling that I was on the verge of losing consciousness. It's all a bit vague, but it seems to me that at that moment, I received a severe blow to the head that knocked me out. The next thing I remember is that I'm in the waiting room of a hospital, where doctors are setting my ribs. Marcy was there and looked completely beaten up. As soon as the doctor finished and left the room, I demanded that Marcy tell me who he was and why he was in our house. Then she explained that his name was Tony. He was her friend whom she had invited to visit. You slept with him. You had sex with him in our bed while our children were sleeping in the living room. Yes, I'm aware. If you hadn't screamed so loudly, they wouldn't have woken up. I had to ask my sister to look after them so I could bring you here. Why was he there? How many times do I have to ask the same question? We made love. We had an affair. Is it really that hard to understand? Does this happen regularly, or was it a one-time occurrence? Tony and I have been dating for about six months now. We tried to keep this a secret from you. We don't usually come to our house, but I couldn't find a babysitter. Is it finished now? No, it's not finished. Danny, you're a great father and husband, but Tony is amazing in bed. I see no reason to end a relationship just because it's open. I promise that we won't meet in our house anymore. It's not fair to you and the kids. I'm sorry, dear. It's not fair. It's all over now. Danny, if you interfere in any way with my relationship with Tony, I can promise that you will feel bad. He just beat you easily and without even breaking a sweat. I can guarantee that it will happen again. If you try to take revenge, all our friends will know that your wife is having an affair and that you are too weak to stop it. Our friends and neighbors will be the first to know about this. I'll make sure your family finds out what a pathetic loser you are. 
Your colleagues will start making fun of you. Think carefully, Danny. Your life will turn into a nightmare. I bet even your sons will be embarrassed by you. Don't you care what people think of you? You'll make a fool of yourself just to blame me. I'll do it if I have to. But I bet you won't take any chances. Tony thinks you're a bum, and I think he's right. You're going to have to learn to live with it, Danny baby. Who the hell is this guy? Where does he work? He doesn't work. Danny. He owns Continental Classics, a luxury car store on Lancaster Pike. You know, the place where you always wanted to go, but you never did? That's it. Danny is richer, smarter, and more skilled in bed than you are. And he also seems to be stronger and better with his fists. If he's so wonderful, why don't you just marry him? I'm keeping you close, darling. Because Tony doesn't want children, and I'm giving up mine to be with him. You play the role of husband and father, and Tony gets all the affection. Why is it difficult for you to understand this concept? Should I accept this situation? You have no other choice. You can either accept the situation, or risk the world finding out about your true identity. Just so you know, I'm moving your stuff to the guest room. Now that everything is open, there is no need for us to continue sharing a bed. I watched Marcy leave and felt relieved. By the way, who was looking after the kids when you left with Tony? Karen usually looked after them, but sometimes I left them at your parents' house. Speaking of Karen, she was the one who introduced me to Tony. When Marcy left the room, I mentally thanked Karen. I was discharged the next morning, but Marcy was nowhere to be found. Left with a choice, to call someone or take a taxi, I chose the latter. Since the kids were at school and Marcy was out, all my things were stacked on the guest bed. I knew Todd and Terry would have questions, but I decided to let Marcy explain the situation. It took less than an hour to arrange my new living space, but various thoughts were swarming in my head. I was sure that Marcy's plan would not be implemented the way she intended. The first thing I did was get my old phone recorder out of the basement. Although it only worked on a landline phone, it was my only way out. Hiding it behind a few cans of paint made me feel a little better. Despite the fact that I was given painkillers, I did not dare to take them and work with mechanisms. Instead, I grabbed a couple of strong pills. Marcy made a big mistake in one thing, in my relationship with the guys I worked with. I told them everything that had happened the previous evening. Everyone had their own ideas, some good and some bad. It's nice to know that friends will be there when you need them. We had an eight-hour shift ahead of us, and everyone was going to spend it figuring out how to fix everything. In the middle of the shift, we stopped for dinner. Well, has anyone come up with an idea? Glenn was the first to speak out. I may not have any ideas, but I have a cousin who works for a man with a rather mysterious past. He specializes in detailing cars and, as far as I know, strongly dislikes a certain DeMarco. If you need any information about a business, buildings, or work schedule, he will be a valuable source of information. It can be very useful. Anyone else? Danny, I have two shotguns and two pistols that you can borrow. They are not registered, so there is no need to worry. Thanks, Barry. But this is probably a little more extreme than I expected. Well, damn it, if you don't want to listen to my idea, then forget it. Freddy's comment drew a few laughs from the audience. Tell us, Freddy. Come on, spit it out, they urged. Freddy suggested tying someone to a tree with their legs spread and lighting a fire between their legs, Indian style. Although everyone liked the idea, it was unanimously rejected. Kyle who had not yet contributed, was stumped when everyone was having lunch. What? Don't look at me like that. I have an idea, but it's a bit out of the box. Let's hear it, Kyle, they suggested. Kyle recalled a story about a prison in Arizona where criminals were forced to wear pink jumpsuits as a form of insult. Although Tony was not such a criminal, Kyle thought that such an approach might work. What if I put a pink jumpsuit on him? But won't he take it off? Someone asked. Kyle suggested going even further, tying him up, painting him pink and rendering him unconscious so he couldn't follow them. After tying him to a chair, they discussed how to keep him in this condition until they found a solution. Should I use sleeping pills or knock him out? 
One suggested using a taser to defuse it unnoticeably, but they didn't know how to approach him so as not to arouse suspicion. A buzzer interrupted their plans, heralding the start of another four-hour shift at the machines. Since their overnight quota was not met, the team worked together to make up for lost time. When I got home, Marcy was already in bed fulfilling her promise not to bring that asshole into the house. I stood at a loss, not knowing what to do next. The ideas that my friends and I discussed seemed stupid and cruel to me, as if from school. Maybe I should just leave a burning bag of dog poo on his doorstep. I needed a more pleasant revenge. The next day, I woke up at noon to find the kids at school, and Marcy moving around the house. After a quick shower and shave, I went out the door. Marcy greeted me with a joyful, Good morning, husband. Don't you have a kiss for your wife? Leaning against the kitchen sink, she had her hand on her hip, and a smirk played on her lips. Without saying a word, I turned and walked out the door. Her sarcastic comment didn't deserve a response. I wanted to have lunch and be alone. I spent the rest of the day aimlessly thinking about what consequences I could bring down on my wife's lover without creating unnecessary problems for myself. Since I had to finish work and make preparations that evening, I decided not to eat at home. It was one of the rare moments I could spend with my sons. I just couldn't bring myself to eat Marcy's cooking anymore. Time flew by imperceptibly, and before I knew it, it was time for work. Before the dinner break, everything went as usual. Danny, I have a taser in my car. Maybe you won't need it and it's useful to have it for self-defense, Calson said proudly. Don't forget to grab it before you leave. Have you ever used it? I shook my head. It would be necessary to test it. Is there anyone interested? The only response was a collective groan at the table. No one seemed to have any new ideas. They were all ready to support any idea I had. With the advent of friends, it became easier for me. When I returned home, everything was back to normal. I had a short night ahead of me, as working the cemetery shift disrupted my sleep schedule, especially on weekends. The next day, I woke up earlier than usual. Todd and Terry were happy to go to Chuck E. Cheese, and Marcy didn't seem to mind when I mentioned that we'd be out all day. Danny, I need you to take a few days off next week. Tony's friend Wally is flying in from Detroit, and we're planning a three-night cruise to Cancun. If you can't take time off from work, maybe your parents can come to our house? Wait, so you're telling me you're going on a cruise with two guys? It looks a little dubious even for you. Don't be so blunt, Danny. It's not like you. Wally will share a room with Karen. They have been friends for several years. Well, I guess that changes everything. I will definitely thank Karen later. I started my day too early so we decided to kill some time at Hobby Lobby before Chucky's opened. The boys were old enough to assemble most of the plastic models on display. There was nothing special about the finished products, but they had a lot of fun. I let them explore the boxes while I admired all the interesting items available to creative housewives. If Marcy had been interested in needlework, she probably wouldn't have brought this hairy gorilla home. But now it was too late to change anything. My excitement increased when I discovered rows of designer paints and spray cans. Among them were six amazing cans of pink paint. They might not have as much paint in them as Lowe's or Home Depot, but they were the only ones in that shade of pink. Taking this as a sign, I decided to buy all six cans. Todd chose a set with a monster truck, and Terry chose a tugboat model, which surprised me, since I didn't know that they make plastic tugboat models. Before leaving, I also grabbed a pack of 10 large plastic cable windings, each about 18 inches long, which I thought would be effective. As soon as we finished shopping, Chuck E. Cheese was open for work. The children spent about four hours there, eating two pizzas before they got tired. We bought a pack of cheap bread and went to the park. During the first ten minutes, the ducks ate all the bread. After spending a few more hours together, we finally went to my parents. They were happy to invite us to dinner and spend the evening with them. 
Todd and Terry were glued to the TV most of the evening, which gave me the opportunity to tell Dad about the situation with Marcy. It dawned on me that I had shared the news before Marcy had time to do it herself. It looked like she was planning to do the same, which made her threats less effective. Dad assured me that they would support the boys no matter how things turned out. It will be much easier to complete the work if we can simplify everything. I was worried that the boys might get hurt in this situation. Around 9 o'clock, I tried to call Marcy to tell her that we would be spending the night at my parents' house, but I only got through to the answering machine. After enjoying a hearty breakfast at IHOP, we returned home to find Marcy still in bed. Wasting no time, I started the lawnmower and got to work in the backyard next to the bedrooms. Despite the beautiful weather outside, Todd and Terry couldn't wait to work on their models. I allowed them to do this and decided to devote the whole day to completing the work on the lawn. It was necessary to make several borders and trimmings. Work was moving slower than usual because I was constantly stopping to chat with the neighbors. I had my own head shears, but I decided to borrow a set from Mike Fielding, who lived across the street. His wife, Mary, was known as one of the biggest gossips in the neighborhood. I told Mike that there might be strange cars parked outside the house, since Marcy's male friends would be coming. I assured him that everything would be fine, as long as they didn't get too violent, in which case he should call the police. Balancing between work and night shifts was not easy. I borrowed a candle key from Larry Finley, who was on the church council, and apologized for Marcy's recent behavior. Larry, being a bigger gossip than Mary, was eager to hear more. In just 10 minutes, he had accumulated enough gossip to last for a month. I skipped lunch and finished work around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. After a quick shower, I treated myself to the most expensive dish on the menu at Rosie's Cantina Restaurant, not knowing what exactly it was, but it was nice. We spent the rest of the evening with my brother Dave and his family. His father had already brought him up to speed. As a result, I stayed the night on his couch. My wife had a bold strategy. She planned to manipulate me into submission by threatening to expose me as a cuckold. If I don't support her infidelity, she's going to make my life hell. It was a smart plan, but it had its drawbacks. Less than a week later, I had already shared the truth with everyone, and her threat proved ineffective. I managed to make Marcy look more like a walking woman than she could have imagined. I don't think she expected any negative consequences. The next day after lunch I went into the house to change for work, but I was met by an angry Marcy. She demanded to tell me what I had told the neighbors. According to Karen, I allegedly spread rumors that Marcy provides escort services at our house at night. I rejected this accusation, explaining that I had simply mentioned the possibility of receiving male guests in my absence advising the neighbors not to make a big deal out of a molehill. But it seems that my explanation was distorted, because Marcy claimed that there was a different version of events. Who else did you talk to? Everyone. I thought it would be easier to tell them before you did. I didn't tell your parents or your sisters anything. Maybe you should tell them before the rumors start. Danny, you're making me look bad. Well, that's fair enough. You're making a fool of me. Well then... I'm sorry, but I have to go to work. I wanted to spend some time with the boys before I left. The difficulty was that I couldn't spend the time I wanted with them. Glenn had some good news. Continental Classics closed early on Thursday so that Tony could personally handle the payday on Friday. He didn't like being disturbed at this time, so even the cleaners left. Carl showed me how to use a taser, but no one wanted to try it out. The plan was coming together. If I was caught, as I expected, I knew I was facing jail time. I didn't care. Tony DeMarco needed to be put in his place. If I had been arrested, I would have made sure that all newspapers and TV channels received full information. Any such publicity would ruin him, or at least make him so angry that he would make a stupid move. Over the next few days, I came home only to sleep, take a shower, and change my clothes. From the very beginning, I have never eaten at home. Finally, Thursday came. 
I made sure my car's battery ran out so Kyle could pick me up. The shop foreman rarely interfered with the work of the brake crews. As long as we completed the production tasks and maintained good quality, he did not bother us. One of the advantages for me was that there were strict OSHA requirements in this job. We all looked the same in aprons, gloves, and welding goggles. At 8.30 in the morning, I quietly left through the back door. The other guys took turns covering my post. It didn't matter if one post was left empty, as toilet breaks were commonplace and not monitored. My main task was to make it seem as if I had never existed. I went through the service entrance to the Continental Classics and went to the bathroom. When the clock struck nine, someone made a cursory inspection before turning off the light. Ten minutes later, I put on a pair of latex gloves and walked out of the bathroom into a dimly lit office space. The man at the table had his back to the door, his attention focused on the antique adding machine, not on the computer in front of him. It turned out that this job might be easier than I expected. He was completely oblivious to my presence as I stealthily approached him. With a precise stun gun blow, I hit Tony on the neck, causing his body to convulsively twitch. Anticipating his possible reaction, I struck again, causing him to twitch briefly, but then relax. Satisfied with his submission, I secured his limbs with plastic cables and blindfolded him with an old tie. I pulled his chair up to the glass window of the exhibition hall and put it in full view of everyone so that his colleagues would come to work the next morning and see him. The paint was a lovely shade of pink, but I realized that I had used too much paint. It seemed to soak into the clothes as soon as I applied it. It took at least three layers on each area to achieve the desired effect. I had enough paint, but it was very difficult. He looked amazing in pink. After finishing my work, I carefully packed all my supplies. I expected Tony to wake up during the process, but he remained motionless. I intended to remove the blindfold before leaving, but as time passed, I kept checking my watch. Although I met the scheduled time, I still wanted Tony to wake up before I left. After waiting for five minutes, I started to worry when I couldn't find a pulse. I wondered if the latex gloves were bothering me, so I took one off and tried again, but to no avail. Attempts to feel for a pulse in the neck as I saw on TV were also unsuccessful. Desperate to find any sign of life, I took off the blindfold and lightly touched his eyeball with the tip of a pencil. But he did not blink or show any reflex. I panicked when I realized the gravity of the situation. Despite my fear, I managed to put on a latex glove and carefully wipe all the surfaces I could touch. I put the tie in my pocket and began to cut off all the plastic ties, exposing the traces of pink paint they had left. It was a strange sight. The white skin under the tie made Tony look like a pink raccoon. After making sure that I hadn't overlooked anything, I went to work. On the way to the store, I threw all incriminating objects, including a taser, into the storm drain. Ten minutes later, I went back to making brake pads, and no one noticed my absence. When the shift was over, I told my colleagues about what had happened, confident that they would not say anything. Freddy was impressed, and the others didn't look worried. Carl kindly drove me home, and we both marked the time when he dropped me off. I couldn't sleep as usual, and around 10 o'clock Marcy burst into my room, demanding to know what I had done. Confused, I asked what she was talking about. She informed me that Tony was found dead in his office that morning, and she thinks I had something to do with it. She threatened to make me pay, repeatedly calling me a jerk. Realizing that I would not be able to rest anymore, I reluctantly got out of bed and went to the bathroom, afraid to meet Marcy's anger. After taking a leisurely shower and shaving, as well as putting on aftershave to annoy my wife, I missed my usual visit to the coffee pot. Instead, I found a tall man in a dark suit talking to Marcy in the living room. It was clear that the witch next door had called the police. Sighing, I headed to the kitchen for my morning coffee, but as I settled into my favorite chair, I met Marcy's smug expression. To my surprise, the uninvited guest joined me. Mr. Mercer, I'm Detective Darnell Green with a letter, he introduced himself. 
I'm here about Anthony DeMarco's death last night. Your wife mentioned the disagreement between you last week and I'd like to ask you a few questions. I agreed but insisted on talking in private, suggesting that the conversation be moved to his office. Marcy's displeasure was obvious as she watched us leave the room. I was sure she expected to participate in the conversation. Will you take my car or yours, Mr. Mercer? He asked. Knowing that I had other things to do before meeting him, I asked. Should I arrive at any particular office? He replied, yes, second floor, office number 206. Just turn right when you exit the elevator. See you soon. Marcy was clearly upset as I pulled on my shoes. I didn't have time to finish my coffee and poured it into the sink. Smiling, I left the house, thinking out loud, Looks like you're going to get your way, honey. Confused, Marcy asked, What do you mean? Ten minutes later, I was in the municipal building, sitting with Detective Green on the second floor. Over the next hour, Detective Green delicately clarified the situation, trying to figure out the novel without being too blunt. I admitted that I had a motive, but stressed that I had never taken any action about it. Despite the seriousness of the situation, I remained polite and cooperative. I think he appreciated that I helped simplify his work, although I couldn't give an answer. The most intriguing part of our conversation was learning about Tony's death due to heart problems. A couple of years ago, he was implanted with a pacemaker, which apparently reacted badly to the stun gun. They were able to determine the cause from the marks on his neck. When I heard about Tony's passing, I felt a mixture of sadness and relief. Detective Green advised me not to leave town until he checked my alibi and promised to follow up on it. The need for an alibi turned out to be unexpected, but to some extent exciting. Detective Green and I parted amicably, and I felt that he supported me. This thought warmed me from the inside. After a quick snack, I watched the news release about the death of a local businessman, which said that he had no relatives nearby. I withdrew money from the bank and then had a leisurely breakfast. There were things waiting for me at home, but Marcy wasn't there when I arrived. It took me half an hour to move my things back to the bedroom and Marcy's things to the guest room. There was only a small closet and a chest of drawers in the guest room, so I put everything on the bed so she could organize everything. I checked the phone recorder in the basement, but I didn't find anything important on it. Having collected all the bank, insurance, and other important documents, I was grateful that Marcy's Volvo was registered in my name, which made the task easier. I put everything in a folder under the front seat of my truck. After calling work to take a two-week vacation, my wife arrived a few hours later and was surprised to find me at home. It's time to sort things out. Smiling, I led her into the guest room, but I met her confusion and anger. I explained that from now on I would live in the master bedroom and she could take the guest room. I suggested that she start folding her clothes. If something is not in the closet or chest of drawers by dinner it will be thrown away. Any questions? I can't fit my stuff in this tiny closet and I don't plan on staying in this room. What do you mean by throw it away? If things don't fit in a closet or chest of drawers, then you don't need them. That's not going to happen, Danny. I do not know what kind of game you are playing, but it will not take place. You better start organizing your stuff. And if you have any more questions, I'll come back later. She called me a klutz three times today, but I took it as a sign that I was doing something right. While Marcy was busy in the guest room, I dumped her purse on the kitchen table and carefully selected what I needed. I took her mobile phone, car keys, driver's license, credit and debit cards and money, leaving the rest untouched. I took the documents for the car from the pickup truck and took her Volvo to the other side of the city to a friend who owns a car dealership. I sold him the car at a fair price on the condition that he resell it outside the city. After paying off the loan, I received a good amount of money. When I was about to go to Taco Bell for lunch, my cell phone rang. Marcy was furious and demanded to know where her phone and car were. I was glad she didn't insult me again. She called from her home phone to give me a chance to check my voicemail when I get home. I'm sorry, honey, I replied, not at all embarrassed. 
I needed to get the funds to hire a lawyer to defend myself against charges of a crime. I promise I'll buy you a new car as soon as I get out of prison. Despite the fact that she continued to swear on the other end of the line, I disconnected the call and turned off my mobile phone. After this conversation, I came to the conclusion that hiring a lawyer is the best solution. Regardless of the outcome, I knew I couldn't stay married. But this decision will have to wait, because I was next in line for the order. Todd and Terry were already there when they arrived home. I immediately went to my son's, completely ignoring Marcia. However, I stole a few glances in her direction and noticed her displeasure. The boys couldn't wait to show me the models they had built. When Marcy started cooking dinner, I headed to the guest room. My clothes were neatly laid out on the bed, and hers were in the master bedroom. I chuckled to myself, deciding not to argue with her stubbornness. Marcy ordered the boys to wash the dishes for dinner, and I went back to the guest room to unpack my things once more. I had a strong desire to throw away all her things, but I knew that it would not be adult. Instead, I decided to treat myself to dinner at Red Lobster. I didn't have to worry about money, as I still had some funds left after paying the deposit to the divorce lawyer. I liked the shrimp and lobster combo, but most of all, I loved the cheese rolls. After finishing my meal, I turned on my phone again, hoping to hear something from work or from Detective Green. Unfortunately, the first call was from my wife. How do I get to the grocery store? We are running out of milk and a few other basic necessities. I can take you when I finish work. Let's agree to shop on Saturdays, when I have a day off. I'll feel better if you don't go alone. Oh, another call? I have to go. We'll catch up when I get home. The second call was from Kyle. Detective Green interviewed all the team members, both individually and together. All their statements matched. Tom Tingle, the floor manager, was particularly supportive. He was adamant that I couldn't skip work, and he watched his staff closely all night to make sure I was there. I wasn't skilled enough to outsmart him. If the detective wanted to hold me responsible for Tony DeMarco's crime, he could easily do it. No one seemed to be on my side. When I got home to put the boys to bed, I found Marcy relaxing on the couch with a glass of wine. I took a cold beer from the fridge and settled into my armchair. The TV was quietly working in the background. I decided it was time to chat with Marcy. I asked her how her plan to turn me into a slacker and a klutz was going. Unfortunately, this question seems to have put an end to the conversation before it even started. Marcy finished her wine, got up and headed for the bedroom, leaving me with the feeling that she didn't want to talk. Disappointed, I took my beer and went to check the recorder. The first conversation I listened to was with Marcy's sister, and there was no attempt to hide anything in it. Marge seemed to know about the affair with Tony and was completely supportive of Marcy. It was nice to know that she had someone standing by her side. The next call was made to Marcy's mom, and it was a little different. Her mom didn't seem to understand anything about the situation. Marcy convinced her that Tony was just a friend of Karen's, and that I was jealous because I had been stalking Karen for years. Her mom hinted that I was done with Tony, although she never said so directly. Then she tried to get a replacement phone, which I took away and reported her driver's license to the DMV. She was advised to report it to the police. When she applied to the bank for a new credit card, she was informed that her account was closed. She was a very busy girl. The last call on the answering machine was addressed to Karen, who lived just a few houses away. It was unclear why they hadn't met in person instead of over the phone. But in the end, everything worked out in my favor. I learned two important details from this call. She had left Detroit, and Marcy planned to keep a low profile until he arrived. The next day, the boys and I got up at dawn. We slipped out of the house before Marcy even opened her eyes. By the time we got back after lunch, Marcy was already demanding to go to the grocery store. Since she didn't have a car or a driver's license, I had to drive her. In the evening, while she was cooking dinner, I listened to the recording. Wally showed up, and his first call was to Marcy. Their conversation was exciting. He believed every word she said and promised to take revenge. 
Wally and Tony, childhood friends, were bound by a close bond that could not be broken. Wally insisted that Marcy call him at the number he provided the next day, when she had a free minute. Excited, Marcy called her friend Karen to share the news of her happiness. I couldn't believe the sudden and abrupt change in my wife. I never thought that my actions, apart from dealing with her lover, had caused such a transformation. Feeling depressed, I decided to eat a burger before going to bed. A classic move. The grass needed to be cut again, and that gave me a great reason to stay away from Marcy the next day. Around 11 a.m., Marcy's parents arrived to pick up the boys. I didn't know they were planning to spend the night at my grandparents, but I decided not to mind. Grandma Wilcox assured me that they would arrive at school on time the next day. In anticipation of listening to phone messages, I had a quick lunch, skipped breakfast, and took a shower before heading to Danny's house. Marcy never mentioned my absence from home while she and Wally were plotting revenge for Tony's death. This plan seemed almost comical to me, although I understood the seriousness of their intentions. That night, Marcy and I went to bed, and Wally planned to sneak into the house through the unlocked sliding door on the back landing. According to their plan, it was supposed to look like I was shot during a robbery. Marcy and Karen should have called 911 after hearing the shot. As I was leaving the house, it dawned on me that I had not updated the data on my insurance beneficiaries. I jokingly kissed my wife and got a cheeky finger in return. I had dinner with my parents and took Dad's snake charmer shotgun before going on vacation. When I got home, Marcy was lying in bed with the light on, probably reading. The only message on the answering machine was from Karen. She bragged to Marcy about her amazing intimacy with Wally all day and assured her friend that she would be ready for him later that night. I spent about 20 minutes replacing the buckshot in the casings with rock salt, using a bag left over from last winter. I wasn't going to hurt Wally. I just wanted to slow him down. I didn't want to hurt Tony either, hoping that Wally didn't have a weak heart like Tony. I decided to check the door to the back landing, but I was afraid that Wally might catch me doing it. I figured Marcy had left the door unlocked. I changed into shorts and spread the blankets on the bed. I wanted to have a cup of coffee, but there wasn't any, so I decided to have a Coke. I was waiting, sitting in an armchair and holding my mobile phone at the ready. He didn't show up until midnight. When I noticed him on the terrace, I quickly dialed 911 and reported that an intruder had entered my house, not forgetting to mention that I feared for my life. The phone line remained open. Wally entered the house through the terrace door, which opened noiselessly. I waited until he was fully inside the house before I fired. I aimed at the lower part of his body, not wanting to accidentally harm him. The first shot threw him onto the terrace. The second shot sent him over the edge of the terrace, breaking the railing. Judging by his screams, he was still alive. The rock salt from the gun must have caused him a lot of pain. The sound of the explosion in the house was deafening and ringing in my ears. As soon as I turned on the light, Marcy was already in the living room and shouting something unintelligible to me. I didn't understand a word of her speech. I quickly checked on Wally and noticed a Ruger Point .2, two automatic with a silencer lying on the floor. Marcy kept screaming so I grabbed the shotgun and pointed it in her direction. She immediately stopped talking and ran out of the room. Wally seems to have broken his ankle in the fall. Some people are just lucky. Ten minutes later the first police car appeared on the street. There were few conversations. I put the shotgun on the floor to avoid confusion. I gestured at the phone and the officer assured the 911 operator that the situation was under control. They asked about other people in the house, and I mentioned Marcy in the bedroom. They took her out into the living room and soon realized their mistake. Marcy didn't stop talking, despite our attempts to calm her down. The female officer carefully led Marcy outside, where I noticed Karen standing with several neighbors. I smiled at her and made a cutting motion through her throat. She left quickly, ignoring me. When the paramedics arrived for Wally, Detective Green appeared with a grin on his face. I couldn't help but smile back, 
even though I didn't want to seem cheeky. An Amazon policeman escorted Marcy into the house to give her a chance to change her clothes. She came to her senses a little. After getting dressed, they went to the police headquarters. Marcy asked to go separately, and Detective Green allowed her to accompany him. They hadn't spoken much during the trip downtown, but Detective Green still smiled at her. By the time Green released her, it was already morning. Despite the fact that Marcy spoke for only half an hour, she was held at the station all night, and because of the constant coffee offered to her, she felt like she was being interrogated at Guantanamo. I was taken home in one of the black and white cars. Feeling a little disappointed, I was hoping to see a yellow ribbon in closing the house. But everything turned out to be in order and untouched. The rock salt didn't even damage the sliding glass door, so it looks like Wally took care of most of the damage. According to my calculations, it will take only an hour to fix the broken railing. Exhausted, I collapsed into bed and woke up only after lunch. Calming down, I headed to the kitchen, where I found the detective, who greeted me with a smile, sitting at the table, sipping fresh coffee and reading the newspaper. When I woke up, I found that he was already there and seemed to have entered the house while I was still asleep. Despite the fact that I had drunk a lot of coffee the day before, I preferred a glass of orange juice, sitting opposite him. Mr. Mercer, you are a very cool dude. I noticed, but he was still focused on his work. Not knowing how to interpret his silence, I said nothing. It was unclear whether he was mocking me or not. When he finished his coffee, I casually mentioned that he needed to take a shower, shave, and have lunch, insisting that he would pay the bill if it did not violate police protocol. Heading to the shower, I couldn't help but wonder how he finds the time to relax. For lunch, we ate two pork sandwiches and washed them down with beer. The silence between us grew heavier and heavier until Mr. Mercer finally broke it by suggesting that I must have questions for him. I couldn't help but think the same about him. We immediately called the waiter for two more beers. I spent the whole night interrogating you. Now it's your turn. First of all, where is my wife? She is still in custody. She will be formally charged today. When I was finishing my beer, he informed me that my wife's parents had hired a lawyer for her. I was stunned by this unexpected turn of events. Despite the fact that I had a lot of questions in my head, I realized that by asking too many of them, I could reveal my involvement. So I decided to hold back. I was pleased to know that Morsi's family was supporting her, as I knew I couldn't be around. I have no further questions, Detective Green, but if you want to share something, please feel free to do so at any time. I said, taking a sip of beer and chuckling softly. And one more thing. Did you by any chance eavesdrop or record conversations between your wife and Mr. Williams or should I say Wally? I couldn't help but grin. If I had such a record, would you want to watch it? I'm not sure yet. In the end, it may not matter, depending on how events unfold. But if one of them hires a good lawyer, he may have a chance. The presence of such a film can create problems for them, don't you think? You are absolutely right. I'm just trying to make my job easier. I'll see what I can do without relying on film, which may or may not be real. I nodded slightly in gratitude. Danny, I think it's time for me to take you home. Your sons will be back from school soon, and they need a father. When we arrived at the house, Todd and Terry got off the school bus. They came up to us, and I introduced them to my new detective acquaintance. They asked to see his badge. The atmosphere was friendly until Green leaned over and asked, So, who built the tugboat, and who built the monster truck? Todd proudly declared, I built a truck! And Terry bragged, I made a tugboat. Would you like to see it? Disappointed, Terry hoped to see them next time. It's time for me to leave, he said leaving me in shock as he walked to his car with a smug grin. This sneaky guy knew about the pink paint. He held my future in his hands, leaving me defenseless. That evening, we decided to order pizza. The boys did not ask about their mother's whereabouts. After dinner, Marcy's father called and asked for help with bail money to get her out of jail. I politely declined, 
Not sure if he really understood the situation, but at least he tried to be a good parent. When I asked where Marcy was going to live, he hesitated before saying she was going to live with him. The boys and I packed up all of Marcy's things and took them to her father. It wasn't difficult for us to pack her things. When I got home, I noticed a U-Haul car that belonged to Karen in the driveway. She was gone the next morning. Marcy never contacted me, and I had to rely on the newspaper. It seemed like I was being deliberately kept out of the way. There was no trial. Mercy blamed Wally for everything, and Wally insisted that it was all her doing. Both Marcy and Wally were convicted of their crimes. Marcy received a sentence of three to five years for conspiracy to commit a crime, and Wally received five to ten years for attempted murder. Federal authorities were notified of the silencer found on Wally, but they preferred to wait until the end of his sentence to bring any additional charges against him. Detective Green did not demand the tape as evidence and never raised the issue again. Karen disappeared without a trace. My father was glad that the gun was returned to him and assured me that I could borrow it again if necessary. He chuckled, and I didn't hesitate to file divorce papers for Marcy as soon as she started serving her prison sentence. She didn't resist. It was clear that she didn't want anything to do with me, since she hadn't been in touch or made any effort to communicate since the night. I shot Wally. I sold our house and returned to live with my parents, as I had difficulty coping with work and caring for our boys. My colleagues were glad to see me back, and although I was given the opportunity to switch to the day shift, I refused for unknown reasons. Every month, I took the boys to the Muncie Women's Prison to visit their mother. While they were with her for less than an hour, I was waiting for them in the car. Sometimes if the weather was good, meetings took place outside, and I could watch them through the chain-link fence. I never asked the boys about their visits, and asked them not to tell me anything. It seemed to suit us all. But everything changed when I got the call. Hello, is this Daniel Mercer? A woman named Angela Hawkins introduced herself and said that Detective Darnell Green had asked her to talk to me. I knew Detective Green, but I couldn't figure out why she wanted to talk to me. Tony DeMarco was my brother, she explained. My heart sank when I realized that the past, which I thought was left behind, was surfacing. I told her that I couldn't help her and quickly ended the conversation. Two days later, Angela called again and asked me to come to her place. There are a few things I need to discuss. Detective Green mentioned that you are a reasonable person. Where would you like to meet? I would suggest a car dealership, but I am ready to meet wherever it is more convenient for you. It took me a while to make a decision, but I decided to meet her on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock at the car dealership. I will be accompanied by my two sons, who love to look at classic cars. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I felt more at ease meeting in a public place with children nearby. I didn't use them as a shield. I just wanted to feel safe. I had a feeling she wouldn't make trouble if my kids were with me. I didn't know what kind of grudge this woman might have against me. If she was Tony's sister, she had to be Italian. And if she is Italian, then she must have a short temper. I knew I had to be careful. But then I realized that I was probably thinking too much about the situation and decided to just have a beer. I called Detective Green to sort out the situation a bit. He just laughed and told me to meet her and not worry too much. It was easy for him to talk. Since he didn't harm her brother, the Continental Classic was an impressive place. He had a main showroom and two large buildings in the backyard for cars in need of restoration. When we arrived, I was surprised to see that they were hosting a grand opening celebration. It took me by surprise. A lot of things were unclear. Terry and Todd were fascinated by the cars and the free gifts, but I was more focused on the smell of popcorn from the vending machine. A man in huge boots with a red nose was handing out bags of fresh popcorn. There was a soda machine nearby and another clown selling hot dogs. The boys won't be hungry for lunch today. Angela Hawkins was easy to spot in the crowd. I immediately realized that she was walking towards me with a confident gait. She had all the classic Italian features, dark hair, dark eyes, olive skin, and a graceful figure. Perhaps a real gentleman wouldn't have noticed her curves. Her height, 
which did not exceed five feet, was emphasized by the enormous height of her brother Tony. As she approached, I felt alarmed, especially when I noticed a smaller copy of her next to her. The girl, who looked about ten years old, bore a striking resemblance to Angela, albeit with lighter hair and a lack of curves. It was obvious that the hostess and I shared a sense of insecurity. Both relied on their children to feel comfortable. As she approached, she held out her hand in a friendly gesture. Daniel Mercer, I suppose? I took her hand and shook it, feeling a familiar gesture, like something from a movie. She smiled, although there was a hint of nervousness in her expression, which, oddly enough, made me feel a little calmer. I stood by in silence until she introduced her daughter, Carla. Carla greeted us with a smile and Todd politely smiled back, introducing himself. Terry held out his hand with a smile. Carla, why don't you give the boys a tour while I talk to their father? Without hesitation, Carla led the guys to the showroom and Todd headed for the hot dog stand. I regarded this as a positive thing. We can discuss everything here or in my office. It's up to you, she suggested. I think the office will be just right, I replied instinctively. We headed for the stairs leading to the upper office. I noticed several employees looking in my direction and whispering to each other. Angela noticed it too and grinned at my concern. The sellers, who were dressed in blue bowling shirts in honor of the store's opening, easily stood out from the rest. But instead of focusing on the customers, they seemed more interested in me. One man at the opposite end of the building grinned broadly and gave me a thumbs up, making me smile back, but at the same time feel a little anxious. I wondered if Detective Green had shared any information about my situation with her. I don't want to bore you with the details of my life, but it seems to me that it is important for you to know at least a little. Tony was my brother, my only family. There were no other relatives. When Tony died in testate, his business passed to me as the sole heir. The executor took a significant part for himself, but I still got more than I expected. It was a small consolation to see at least some positive coming out of this situation. As she continued to explain to me, I couldn't help but notice her pierced ears, her wedding ring, and a small silver cross around her neck. But my gaze kept straying to her cleavage, reminding me how long it had been since I'd had intimacy. Before I could get lost in my thoughts, she interrupted me, asking if I was listening attentively with a smile on my face. I quickly apologized, admiring her cross, and reminding myself to focus on her eyes and listen carefully. Playfully hitting my hand, she asked, Do you want a beer? I thought it was a good idea. There was a mini fridge next to the table so she had to bend down to get the drinks. At that moment I couldn't help but see her cleavage. Suddenly a beautiful smile appeared on her face as if she was trying to seduce me. It worked, even if it wasn't her intention. She handed me the jar and we both took a few sips without saying a word. Miss Hawkins, I'm glad you did it, but I should probably get back to the guys before they start to worry, I said. She insisted that I call her Angela and asked if she could call me Danny. I agreed and asked if we were done. She snapped, No, just sit here quietly until I'm done. Detective Green said you'd understand. I was silent, knowing that the sooner I did it, the sooner she would finish. Tony was a disgusting man who deserved his fate. It may seem strange, but I felt the need to express my gratitude to you. It was a setup. This detective was trying to trick me. Were there wires in the room or was it her? She could have had a bug hidden in her bra. Damn it, I was staring at her cleavage again. Do you have a wire or some kind of recording device on you? No way! Why would I do something like that? I finished my beer, still feeling insecure. Maybe I should go downstairs and check on the guys. I don't want them to get in trouble. Stay quiet. She was firm in her decision. Tony and I never got along. About three years ago, my husband died in an accident. He didn't have life insurance and neither did the other driver. I was left without a job and with my daughter in care. Tony, my only relative, reluctantly helped pay for some of the funeral expenses, but then cut off all contact. When you mentioned that his death was good for you, 
I realized that maybe the same thing happened to me. Maybe we should be grateful for what happened and move on, I said with a smile, finishing my beer. Sensing my reluctance to continue the conversation, she changed the subject. I have a request. I need your help. You're the only one who can help me. Confused, I asked what she needed. She boldly asked me to become the general manager of her car business. I was stunned as I didn't know anything about this industry, especially luxury cars. She assured me that she has a team that deals with the technical aspects, and she needs me for something else. Angela was a little nervous, her gaze darting from her feet to the walls as she tried to formulate her thoughts. Did you notice how my colleagues looked at you when you escorted me to the office? What is it? She asked. They weren't smiling. They all think you're responsible for Tony's death. They used to be afraid of Tony, but now they seem to be afraid of you. It's fear with a touch of respect. Do you understand what I'm getting at? They treat you with great respect. What are my options? I guess I should just stay here. Eventually, we'll both become knowledgeable enough about the business to control it. In the meantime, I need you to come forward and intimidate them. I'm a kind person, Angela, so Tony and my wife thought they could use me for their own purposes. But they quickly realized that wasn't the case, didn't they? Angela seemed to relax a little at my reassurances. I thought it was funny, and I chuckled a little. Angela and I spent the next half hour discussing the terms. She had no problem offering me a salary and benefits that surpassed those I received at the factory. If things don't go as planned, I can always go back to my old job, but I didn't want to go back. I was hoping for a successful outcome. When we went downstairs, Todd looked really sick, probably from an overabundance of hot dogs and soda. Terry, on the other hand, was having a lot of fun. He seemed more interested in chatting with Carla than inspecting cars, which was a positive sign. During the trip home, Todd got sick in the car and ended up skipping dinner. I started work the following Monday, and everything turned out as Angela had expected. I was surprised at how quickly I was able to adapt to the work environment. I developed close relationships with some colleagues, and soon I had informants all over the workplace. The friendly guy in the blue shirt who greeted me with a smile on the first day turned out to be Glenn's cousin, my biggest defender. Most of the employees were committed to the success of the business and were ready to report any violations. Angela allowed me to take responsibility for firing employees, and I found that I really liked it. I lived up to my reputation. Detective Green sometimes came over for coffee, and our conversations were usually casual and friendly. In the end, I managed to get him to open up a little. He told me that he was a police officer in Philadelphia three years ago. One day, when he returned home, he found his wife in bed with the boss, and he had to engage in a physical fight with them. I immediately kicked my wife out and received a decision from the police department. Either resign or be fired. A week later, he found a new job. Before leaving, he made sure that the man who was involved with my wife was also fired. I didn't ask for details because it was his personal business. I appreciated his support on my part. My sons agreed not to tell my mother about my new job on visiting days. They mentioned the long road, but they understood the situation we were in. I thought it was extremely important for Marcy to spend time with her sons, but not for myself but so that I could intentionally hurt her. I realized that this is a cruel way to involve my children, but I got some kind of malicious pleasure from it. Angela and I were getting closer, both at work and outside of it. One weekend, the boys asked me to take them and Carla to Nobles Grove. We usually stayed closer to home, and our life situation did not allow a love relationship to flourish. I was intrigued by the idea of getting closer to Angela, but our life situations did not allow us to do this. I still lived with my parents and the boys, and Angela and Carla shared a small studio apartment. With the success of our business, Angela started discussing the possibility of buying a house. She spent hours on the internet searching for the perfect home. It was only when she mentioned that she needed a four-bedroom house that I realized the reality of our situation. I immediately realized that it is wiser to solve these issues now 
rather than later. Don't you think so? It dawned on me that this question was a deliberate ploy. I felt that Angela saw in me something more than just an ordinary employee. The possibility of a romantic connection seemed promising. Yes, I agree, and I think it would be useful to consider the option of separate bedrooms. I wish they weren't too close to the master bedroom. With these words, I quickly left the office. As I watched her, I noticed a slight smile playing on her lips. Our relationship was unusual. Despite the fact that we had never been close or shared a kiss, I felt a deeper connection with her than I had with Marcy in the last ten years. Two days after my divorce was finalized, we gathered at the Red Lobster to celebrate. Although the children did not pay attention to this event, Angela knew about its significance. When we returned to the apartment, and the children were engrossed in watching a paid movie, Angela took the moment to corner me in the kitchen, and, standing on tiptoe, planted a kiss on my lips. We were hugging and laughing softly when Carla came in. Oh, I'm sorry, Mom. As she left, she jokingly remarked, Just in time. When we returned to the living room, Carla was sharing secrets with Terry, and they were both grinning. For the rest of the evening, Angela and I behaved as usual, but I couldn't wait for what would happen next. The next day, while the children were at school, Angela and I sneaked off to the apartment for a long lunch. We both needed to release our accumulated energy. It was just before the end of the working day that we finally returned to our business. Numerous long lunch breaks followed, and Angela was determined to find a new home. Detective Green visited us regularly, often coming in just to chat, but sometimes showing interest in cars. He liked Studebaker Hawk, previously owned by film critic Roger Ebert, and Angela offered him a lucrative deal. Danny, I need you to take me to Marcy's, she suddenly asked. The boys and I started driving less often than before, but Marcy didn't seem to mind. I couldn't figure out why. I needed to end the conversation, but I didn't even know what it meant. I knew the words, but the idea itself was incomprehensible to me. Do you want me to come with you? Just take me there. You don't have to stay with me when I talk to her. When we arrived at Marcy's, it was a beautiful sunny autumn day. The visits to the prisoners took place outside, so I parked at the fence. Ten minutes later we were there. Marcy and Angela went out into the exercise yard and sat down at a table, chatting animatedly and exchanging smiles like old friends. But after a few minutes, the mood changed dramatically. Marcy's smile faded, and she frowned, leaning toward Angela. While Angela was keeping her spirits up, Marcy suddenly rushed across the table, trying to grab her guest. The riots were quickly stopped by the guards, who escorted Marcy back into the building. Angela turned, glanced at me, grinned, and walked impassively out of the visitor's area. Her smile didn't leave her face as she walked back to the car. What the hell just happened? Your ex-wife is definitely short-tempered. Angela seemed to be holding back her laughter. We drove in silence for a while, until she suddenly shifted in her seat, pressing down on her seatbelt. I tried to start a conversation, and she seemed happy to join in. As long as she thought I was on her team, everything went smoothly. I must admit that at first I may have misled her. When she asked me why I came, I said it was for revenge and she thought it was against you. But really, I just wanted to take over Tony's business to get back at him. Is it possible to take revenge on someone who is no longer alive? Of course, she was upset when she demanded details about when, where, and how this would happen. It was clear that she was talking about you. I informed her that the assignment would be long and asked if she would like to receive information about the progress of the work. She readily agreed and demanded to tell me about the specific technique that I was going to use. When I revealed my plan to her, she was furious. She completely lost control of herself and went crazy. It was very funny. Good. Good. How exactly are you going to eliminate me? I demanded. Her grin widened as she simply replied, I'm going to make love to you until I lose consciousness. That was the end of it. I was hoping she might get angry, but her violent reaction took me by surprise. 
There was a short pause of silence and we both sat with smiles on our faces. I couldn't help but feel proud of her. When do you plan to launch an attack? I asked. As soon as we get to the next motel, silly, she replied. Two months later, Angela and I exchanged vows in a small ceremony held in the backyard of our new home. Angela sent Marcy an invitation to the wedding, enclosing a short message. Everything is going according to plan. You won't be here in 40 or 50 years. Goodbye, stupid and deceitful woman. He's mine now forever. You've lost the perfect man. Two hours have passed since leaving New York on Friday afternoon. It was still an hour's drive to the house. They took their daughter Lisa to the university campus so she could start college. Nancy glanced at her husband Bill, who was driving their Ford Transit. They couldn't use their BMW convertible for the trip, as they needed a place to transport Lisa's belongings. Time really flies, Nancy thought. On the day of her high school graduation, she decided to take a pregnancy test, which showed a positive result. Bill was studying at the university at the time, getting an engineering degree. Fortunately, their parents supported them and treated the situation with understanding, because they knew each other well and were aware of the strong bond of the couple. After the birth of the child, she moved in with her parents, and after Bill graduated from university, they tied the knot. As a housewife, she watched her husband go from being a junior engineer at a nearby factory to owning his own successful air conditioning business 10 years later. Since then, the business has flourished. Bill successfully signed contracts with large construction companies. Known for his solid work ethic, he dedicated his life to work and family. The house won't be the same without her, Bill says sadly. She was always closer to you than to me. She was always daddy's daughter. She's our princess, and she needs to be treated that way, Bill added. But have you noticed how she's been acting lately? She treats me like trash. When you were at home, she was always there for you. But sometimes she laughed at me. When you weren't at home, she locked herself in her room to avoid me. Come on, Nancy, she's just a kid. In her senior year, she was heavily pressured to get the highest grades in order to fulfill her dream of going to Columbia University. Please try to understand. I know, Bill, but did you notice how she reacted every time we were in the same room? Do you remember how two months ago I was sitting on the couch and she came up behind me with a knife? That day I thought she was going to hurt me. The hatred in her eyes was unmistakable. It's just your imagination, Nancy, Bill said irritably. Nancy didn't answer, not wanting to prolong the conversation and risking angering Bill even more. Instead, she took out her phone and sent a text message. We'll be there in 30 minutes. A moment later, her phone beeped. Is this from Lisa? Bill asked. No, it's Betty, Nancy replied. How does she feel about gender? At our last barbecue party, she complained that he was coming in late and that she was giving him more time and care than he was giving her. She must understand that being a sheriff is hard work. Maybe she should have thought about it before marrying him. Nancy chose to remain silent, hoping that Bill would remain calm until they returned home. She looked out the window and prayed for their speedy return. When Bill arrived home, he found the sheriff's car parked in front of his garage. He parked his van behind her and was greeted by Paul and his assistant. Confused, Bill asked Paul, What's going on? Nancy ran up and stood behind Paul's assistant. Bill frowned. This is the most unpleasant aspect of my job, which I just despise. The sheriff handed Bill a thick paper envelope with the inscription, William Thompson, you have been served. Shocked, Bill asked Paul, is this a joke? With trembling hands, he accepted the envelope and turned to Nancy, who was avoiding his gaze. Confused, Bill asked Nancy, why? What have I done? Nancy advised him to leave, consult with a lawyer and resolve the issue of their divorce while mentioning the restraining order. You are not allowed to be near Nancy or approach this house within a 500-foot radius, Paul said. Just last Sunday you and Betty attended Lisa's barbecue party. You knew about everything. Seven, you visited my house, took advantage of my hospitality, and even wished Lisa good luck in her future endeavors. And you all left with smiles on your faces. This, my friends 
is the epitome of hypocrisy. Bill, please try to understand the seriousness of Paul's words. Why are you acting like an idiot? Bill shouted, his anger directed at Nancy. You stabbed me in the back! He looked at her, hurt and betrayed. If you don't love me anymore, you should have just said so. I would agree to a peaceful divorce. Nancy gave him a determined look. Bill, the restraining order has gone into effect. I suggest you leave. Paul, trying to defuse the tense situation, urged Bill to calm down. Ignoring him, Bill stormed into his van and angrily threw the envelope on the seat, then slammed the door and walked over to the floor. I need to pick up my personal belongings. I hope you won't mind if I go into my house and get them, he said, taking out the house key and heading for the front door. Your key won't do, Paul informed him, handing the bunch of keys to the assistant. I see that everything has already been done. Has Betty tried her best? She was supposed to be here today with a mechanic while we were gone. Am I right? Bill asked without getting an answer. He nodded to his assistant, who led Bill into the house and stood by while Bill packed two suitcases. Don't worry, Paul reassured Nancy. My team will patrol regularly. I suggest you stay at home for a few days. He is very upset and may do something rash. Nancy agreed and said, I'll stay at home. A friend is coming to visit me for the weekend. Paul muttered, Yes, friend. Bill came out with the suitcases and loaded them into the van. The assistant handed Nancy a bunch of keys. Bill took the envelope, took out the divorce document and began to read it. Bill, you've packed your things and it's time for you to leave, Paul ordered. Wait, she wants 50% of my business, half of our savings, a house, a car and monthly alimony. It's going to cost me a fortune, Bill exclaimed angrily. If you decide to stay, I'll have to take action and detain you, Paul warned, reaching for the handcuffs on his waist. That's not necessary, Paul. I will sign the documents immediately and will not interfere, Bill assured, picking up a pen and following the instructions indicated by the small arrow stickers. Could you notarize the contract and provide me with a copy? Nancy, Paul, and his assistant were stunned by Bill's unexpected fulfillment of all the conditions. Nancy couldn't help but smile, feeling happy about this outcome. She got everything she wanted and finally got rid of her husband and daughter. Paul signed the documents as a witness and gave Bill a copy. As Bill walked to his van, he violently attacked Nancy. Who is he? How long have you been together? Paul told Nancy to go inside and lock the door, and he went to Bill's van. The assistant led Nancy inside. Don't make stupid decisions. Think about Lisa. I have already made a mistake by marrying this person. Bill shouted, starting the engine. She decided to divorce me because she knew that I would never agree to an open marriage. What? What do you mean by an open marriage? Paul asked in shock. Don't pretend, Paul. We all know. What are you talking about? Listen, Paul. We all know that when you work at night, your brother Tom sleeps with your wife, quite calmly, warming your bed. You're provoking a rift in the relationship between me and my brother. Unfortunately, your wife is cheating on you. Since you have already betrayed me in the past, I have no compunction in telling you this unpleasant news. From the looks of it, you're used to dealing with unreliable people. Despite the fact that you hold the post of sheriff, it seems that it is difficult for you to discern the truth. I suggest you talk to Betty when you get home to get confirmation. Goodbye, cuckold. After being instructed to leave his old property, Bill turned around and left. Nancy left alone, poured herself a glass of wine and admired Pagnol's masterpiece railway station, which was estimated at more than a hundred thousand dollars. He left his loss here, she thought, grinning. Determined, she dialed Jason's number on speed dial. But when the call didn't connect, she shouted into the phone, Come on, Jason, pick up the phone! She hung up the phone and sat down thoughtfully. She couldn't help but think that he should come to her right after work. After taking a sip of wine, she remembered how they first met a year ago. They bumped into each other at the mall where he was in charge of the shoe department. He was about 20. He had a perfect body, from which she instantly melted. They exchanged phone numbers, and the next day she called him, inviting him to her house. 
During the lunch break, he came and made passionate love to her. After the stormy intimacy, she could barely walk. In the evening, she told Bill that she wasn't feeling well and went to bed early. From that moment on, she realized that Bill would never be able to match her young and energetic lover. Bill was constantly busy with his own business and often felt tired. Despite this, he diligently helped Lisa with her homework, and then stayed up late doing paperwork. As soon as he went to bed, he immediately fell asleep. A week ago, she was in the shower with Jason, and he took her by the place where she was sitting now. It was a forbidden act that she always denied her husband, but Jason made it clear that she belonged only to him. The day before, he had practically driven her to exhaustion during their passionate meeting at home. With a spare key at hand, she could visit her lover whenever she pleased. Sometimes, she would surprise him by cleaning the whole apartment while he was at work. She also inundated him with gifts, clothes, shoes, cologne, and expensive watches for his birthday. Sometimes, she gave him generous money and let him drive her BMW. Nancy found herself pining for him, feeling incredibly excited. Trying to remember the last time she had been intimate with Bill, she realized that she couldn't remember if it had been three months, six months, or even more since then. But it didn't matter to her. She had her young lover, a real man who could satisfy her needs. Now they will finally connect, and they will no longer have to be afraid of anyone. She was free, knowing that he would move in with her that evening. After taking a shower, she entered the living room, took out her mobile phone and called, where are you, Jason? Why aren't you answering your phone? Disappointed, she went to the kitchen and made herself a light dinner, lamenting, I wish I could leave home and go to him. Suddenly, something on the TV screen caught her attention, and she hurried back to the living room and turned up the volume. Nancy was horrified to see Paul being led in handcuffs to a police car. The TV presenter announced that Sheriff Paul Anderson first caused irreparable harm to his wife with a service weapon, and then to his brother at his workplace. Both his wife and brother died tragically. Nancy turned off the TV, feeling stunned. Oh, Betty, I warned you to be careful, she muttered to herself. The realization of this fact struck her. It was Bill who informed Paul about his wife's infidelity, which eventually led to a catastrophic outcome. Tears welled up in Nancy's eyes when she realized that her actions had unwittingly caused the death of her closest friend and her lover. Despite Paul's considerable help in eliminating her husband, she did not show the slightest concern for his well-being. That evening, sleep did not come to her, and for the first time she felt completely isolated. She kicked her husband out, her lover was unavailable, her best friend died, her daughter avoided her, her parents died, and her sister now lived with her husband Tom, 300 miles from home. It was Sunday morning, and Nancy was getting more and more worried because she still couldn't get in touch with Jason. The lack of communication with Jason was beginning to worry and upset her. He could at least leave a message, she thought to herself more than once. Deciding to find out what was going on, Nancy decided to visit Jason's apartment. When she entered the apartment, she was seized with a feeling of anxiety. She immediately noticed that all the photos on the wall and electronic devices had disappeared. The closet was empty, and there was no sign of his belongings in the bathroom. Collapsing onto the bed, Nancy moaned, He's gone. He left without saying a word. She couldn't understand how he could leave her after he convinced her to divorce Bill and build a future together. Determined to find answers, Nancy left the apartment and headed to the mall, which is open on Sundays, hoping to meet Jason. She recognized one of Jason's colleagues. A colleague informed her that Jason suddenly left work on Friday morning, saying he had left his wallet in the room. He never returned, but instead sent his resignation letter to the boss. Devastated, Nancy headed for her car, wondering why he had done this to her. Tears were streaming down her face and she couldn't understand what he was doing. On the way home, she stopped at a gas station and discovered that her credit and debit cards were not working. The shock of this situation increased her anxiety even more. Nancy, in a rage, emptied her wallet to pay for expenses, 
and then went home to drown her grief in alcohol. The following Monday, she went to the bank to meet with the manager, but was shocked by the news that less than $5 remained in their joint account with her husband. The manager informed her that her husband had closed their shared credit card and stated that he would no longer be responsible for the mortgage of the house and her car, stating that they were divorcing. Nancy was stunned, insisting that it was a mistake. My car is fully paid off, and the mortgage on the house should have been paid off too, Nancy exclaimed. Moreover, the bank has provided a loan for your car. We have all the necessary documents, Mrs. Thompson. In addition, your husband took out a second mortgage on the house to pay for your daughter's education and other expenses, the banker explained. But why don't I have any money in my account? Nancy asked. Last week, your monthly mortgage payment was debited from your account, the banker explained. Not a single deposit has been made in the last three months, which has led to the depletion of the remaining funds. What about the money from my husband's business company? Unfortunately, you cannot access information about your husband's account, but it is quite clear that failure to make upcoming mortgage payments will result in the confiscation of your house and car. Despite the fact that you are a housewife with no income, the consequences of missing payments will be very serious. You should discuss these issues with a lawyer, he advised. Then she checked the safe she shared with her husband. Inside, she found only her jewelry, which she immediately put in her purse. After leaving the bank, she immediately called Bill on her mobile, but received a voice message saying that the number was no longer in service. Perplexed, she tried to call Bill at his workplace, but the phone went unanswered. Disappointed, she cursed under her breath and quickly dialed Lisa's number. What do you want, you bastard? Lisa was shouting furiously into the phone. How do you talk to your mother, Lisa? Nancy replied, taken aback. How would you like me to address you? Lisa answered. I just need to talk to your father, Nancy muttered. I can't reach him on the phone. Do you know where he is or how to contact him? I know, but I won't tell you. You're just heartless. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't see you as my mother anymore. Please don't contact me anymore. I'll change the number. The phone went dead. Nancy sat in the car, clutching the steering wheel, and lost in her thoughts. She wondered what she had done to make Jason leave without saying a word. By calling her lawyer, Nancy was able to arrange an appointment in the afternoon. During the meeting, the lawyer informed her that her husband had filed for bankruptcy before she could hand him the divorce papers. As a result, the company is likely to be liquidated. Nancy, feeling disappointed, mentioned that he had previously told her that she could get millions as a result of the divorce. The lawyer tried to calm her down, explaining that just two weeks before there had been no signs of financial problems and everything seemed to be working in her favor. The company's bank account has been frozen. What about the car and the mortgage on the house? Last week, he used the house as collateral for a loan, even before he filed for divorce. And as for the car, when you signed the certificate of ownership, you also signed a loan in your name. Nancy began to cry. Mrs. Thompson, I have a personal question for you. Do you think your husband knew that you had filed for divorce? No, Nancy replied, lost in thought. He was completely stunned by what was happening. She paused to take a deep breath and then continued. As far as I understand, I will not receive any money from my husband's company. I have no funds in my bank account, and my car and house are under threat of confiscation. The lawyer hesitated, and then added, Unfortunately, yes, that's the reality. Is there any chance that he will be able to cover the mortgage payments? The company was his only income. Without it, he is bankrupt. As soon as he finds a job again, you will receive alimony. We lost several investment certificates from the safe, we need to find out when they were cashed out and investigate his company. Besides, we need to find your husband since we don't know about his whereabouts. His lawyer handles all the cases. Please find him. Mrs. Thompson, there are additional costs associated with this. How do you plan to cover them? 
Nancy had never thought about all these expenses before. She suddenly laughed. I have a very valuable painting, she announced. That's great. As soon as you get the money, write us a check and we can get to work. Nancy agreed and said, No problem. I'll get back to you soon. Before ending the conversation, the lawyer added, And one more thing, Mrs. Thompson. Perhaps you should consider leaving your home. You should start looking for a place to live. Back at home, Nancy sat down in front of Pagnol's painting. I really wanted to keep you, but because of my terrible husband, I have to sell you, she said, looking at the painting. She took out her cell phone and dialed her sister's number. Hi, sis, I need to ask you a favor. You know I've never contacted you before. Bill and I are getting divorced. My sister's shocked voice rang out on the line. What? Is this a joke? No, sis, this is reality. Can I stay with you for a while? I will explain everything personally. How did Lisa react to this news? You know she's following her father's example. I feel like a villain in this situation. Do you both have a way to solve this problem? Perhaps the help of a psychologist will help you. I don't think anything will help anymore, and I apologize for the inconvenience. It's okay that you stay with us. I think Tom won't mind and our daughter will be delighted with your presence. Thank you, little sister. I will inform you of my arrival. After hanging up, Nancy decided to take her jewelry for examination on Tuesday. By the time she arrived, the jeweler informed her that all her jewelry was actually made of gilded copper and had a low cost. She cursed Bill for giving her fake gifts and quickly found an appraiser at a fine art gallery. I would like to know the price of my painting Pagnell Railway Station, Nancy asked. The appraiser examined the painting carefully and remarked, The railway station is Pagnell's best work. He skillfully conveyed a whole range of emotions in his work, combining arrival, departure, happiness, and sadness in one work. Carefully placing the painting on the easel, he shone the light of the lamp on it and carefully examined it with a magnifying glass. After a few moments, he burst out laughing. Nancy asked in disbelief, What happened? Why are you laughing? Grinning, he took out his laptop, put it next to the easel, and opened the website to show her something. After pressing a few keys, an image of the painting appeared on the screen. He focused on the lower left corner, paying attention to the man and the girl on the platform, watching the woman who was walking towards the train with her back turned. The man looked sad, and the girl was crying. Nancy was puzzled. So what? What is it? What is it? She asked. Then the man handed her a magnifying glass and told her to take a closer look at the same scene in her painting. Nancy took a quick glance at the bottom left corner and was shocked. In the painting, a man and a little girl were laughing and giving the woman the middle finger, as if mocking her. It's a fake, Nancy muttered. I'm sorry, but what can I do? She sank into a chair, feeling hopeless. I can offer you $200. I just want to hang it up so my friends and clients can have a good laugh. Nancy made a deal and left feeling defeated. After checking her phone, she missed a call from her sister and decided to call her. Hi, sis. Nancy said, trying to hide her sadness, but the sister's response was harsh. Don't call me sis, you trash. Shocked and confused, Nancy asked, What? Why? Tom received a letter from an unknown sender which was sent to all our relatives and friends. The letter contained a link to a website with numerous videos of your intimate relationship with a young guy starting last year and ending last week. Nancy, how could you do that? Her sister's voice was screaming. You had an intimate relationship with some asshole in the marital bed, and some scenes take place in a two-cent hotel room. I have to explain, Nancy begged. You don't need to explain anything to me. You're disgusting, her sister replied. Tom doesn't want you around our family. He said you would defile me and my daughter. Our doors are closed to you. Go to your lover. The phone went off abruptly, leaving Nancy stunned and heartbroken. Oh my God! He knew! He knew everything from the beginning! What should I do now? She started to feel dizzy. Now everyone knows everything! I have to get as far away as possible! 
Five years later, Bill sat in the front row of the church and reflected on the phone call he received that morning. Keeping it to himself, he couldn't believe that he would have to remember it on such an important day. Just a few minutes ago, he proudly led Lisa down the aisle and watched her say yes to her beloved boyfriend. His thoughts went back to the day Lisa called him in tears, begging him to come home. He was in his office when his daughter's frustrated voice came on the line. Dad, please come home, she cried. Bill, shocked, asked what was the matter, and heard Lisa's request to hurry up while she was waiting for him on the street in front of their house. What's the matter? I'll call your mom, Bill said. Lisa quickly replied. No, please don't call her. Just come here, please, Dad, she begged. Bill assured her. I'm on my way, dear. As he drove home, a feeling of anxiety crept into his soul. Various thoughts raced through my head. Why isn't Lisa at school? Why was she outside the house and not inside? Why didn't she want him to warn Nancy? Is she hurt? Suddenly, he braked with a screech of tires. As he approached the red light, he reminded himself to remain calm. He remembered that Lisa had been working on the project until late at night. He even helped her and offered her some ideas. Together they put everything together in a PowerPoint presentation and saved it on a USB drive. Lisa was waiting for him just one block away from home. Bill stopped the car and she quickly got in. Dad, please don't come into the house, Lisa begged. Okay, Lisa, tell me what's going on, Bill replied. Bill turned off the engine. This morning, in my hurry to go to school, I forgot my USB flash drive. I managed to get special permission to return home during lunch to pick her up. Driving up to our house, I noticed an old Honda. When I entered the house, I heard unusual sounds coming from moms in your bedroom. I carefully climbed the stairs and looked into the room. The door was slightly ajar. Lisa started crying. Okay, honey, just breathe, Bill said soothingly gently stroking her back. Bill sat in stunned silence while Lisa sobbed in front of his eyes. The words she said pierced him like a knife. I saw a man. They were both naked. They were making love, Dad. She's cheating on you on us. His mind raced, trying to process the information he received. He never thought that he would hear such words from his own daughter. With a heavy heart, Bill turned to Lisa and asked, are you sure about what you saw? Her answer shocked him even more. I recorded it on my phone, she said, handing him her cell phone. Bill felt a knot forming in his stomach as he watched the video of Nancy's betrayal unfold before his eyes. The sound of Nancy's voice filled the room, and Bill's world collapsed around him. Lisa's plea broke through the haze of disbelief. Throw me out of the house, Dad! I don't want to see her anymore! I need to think about my options. Why are you hesitating? Just throw her out. It's not that easy, honey. Legal steps need to be taken. Dad, do you still want to be with her? Do you still want to sleep in the same bed with her? I do not support infidelity, but it is important to understand its causes. Was it a one-time mistake or a long-term affair? Will it happen again? Bill sat in stunned silence while Lisa sobbed in front of his eyes. The words she said pierced him like a knife. I saw a man. They were both naked. They were making love, Dad. She's cheating on you, on us. His mind raced, trying to process the information he received. He never thought that he would hear such words from his own daughter. With a heavy heart, Bill turned to Lisa and asked, Are you sure about what you saw? Her answer shocked him even more. I recorded it on my phone she said, handing him her cell phone. Bill felt a knot forming in his stomach as he watched the video of Nancy's betrayal unfold before his eyes. The sound of Nancy's voice filled the room, and Bill's world collapsed around him. Lisa's plea broke through the haze of disbelief. Throw me out of the house, Dad. I don't want to see her anymore. I need to think about my options. Why are you hesitating? Just throw her out. It's not that easy, honey. Legal steps need to be taken. Dad, do you still want to be with her? Do you still want to sleep in the same bed with her? I do not support infidelity, 
but it is important to understand its causes. Was it a one-time mistake or a long-term affair? Will it happen again? After a tiring day of cleaning the house, sweating, I don't think you'll like it, especially since you promised to deliver Lisa her flash drive. You're right, Bill said. At work, Bill searched the internet for the best surveillance devices and spyware for mobile phones. He bought all the necessary equipment at an electronics store. In the evening, he decided that from that day on, he would never touch his wife. As promised, he told Lisa about everything. Over the next three months, he learned a huge amount of information. He found out all the details about Nancy's lover, Jason White. Jason came to their house almost every day, stopping by in the morning before the second shift or during lunch. On weekends when Nancy went shopping, she would visit him if he wasn't at work. Bill also found out that she has a spare key to his apartment and that she often buys gifts for Jason. He overheard a conversation between Nancy and her best friend Betty, during which they revealed their innermost secrets. It was then that he found out about Betty's affair with her brother-in-law. One Saturday, Bill rummaged through Nancy's purse and found a hidden key at the bottom. In a hurry, he drove to the mall and made a duplicate key. The following week, he went to Jason's apartment, located in a disadvantaged area of the city. The building was in such disrepair that there were no surveillance cameras in it, and the main entrance remained unlocked. He strategically placed a lot of miniature hidden cameras around the apartment, each of which was powered by long-lasting lithium batteries. In addition, he carefully identified and compiled a list of all Nancy's valuable purchases. Bill began to develop a strategy to end the relationship with maximum consequences for both Nancy and her lover. He ordered a jeweler to make copies of expensive items made of gilded copper. I made an order for a fake painting depicting Pagnol Station, carefully executed by an experienced artist in accordance with certain instructions. He met an old friend of his youth named Steve, who worked as a corporate lawyer. Intrigued by his plan, Steve quickly arranged a meeting in a few days. During the conversation, Steve introduced him to his cousin Linda, an experienced auditor known for her knowledge of the industry. Bill openly and frankly told them both about his intentions. He planned to legally liquidate his company and manage it remotely. A few years later, he planned that his daughter Lisa would acquire the company. He often dated Linda, a widowed woman who hadn't dated since her husband died in a car accident. She had a 10-year-old son. Over time, a friendship developed between them. In the end, he invited her to dinner and a movie, to which she agreed. Later that evening, Lisa went to spend the night with a friend, and Bill went to Linda's. Thank you for agreeing to go on a date with me, he told Linda. This is my first date since my husband died. Did you like everything? Yes, thanks. I liked it. Would you like to do it again sometime? We're working together and you're still married, she reminded him, leaning in to kiss his cheek. Let's do everything in order, she said, getting out of the car and heading for her house. Bill suggested that Nancy change her car. Nancy hesitated at first because she was tied to her Lexus, but eventually agreed when Bill said that driving a BMW convertible would make her look younger. Since the Lexus had already been paid for, Bill sold it and got the money. Then he got a loan for a BMW car, which he issued in the name of Nancy. When Nancy signed the documents, she believed that this was done to obtain a certificate of ownership. Taking breaks between signing documents, she unknowingly signed other papers that would later create problems for her. A few weeks later, Bill noticed Jason's strange behavior. After making love to Nancy, he would leave the bedroom undressed and sneak into Lisa's room while Nancy went to the bathroom. This discovery infuriated Lisa when Bill brought it to her attention. Together they decided to install a camera in Lisa's room to conduct further investigation. What they found was horrifying. Jason saw him taking Lisa's underwear out of a drawer and using it for other purposes. That afternoon, Nancy was sitting on the couch when Lisa crept up behind her with a knife. If Bill hadn't intervened, Nancy could have been seriously injured. Later in the evening, 
Lisa boldly told her father that she would not face jail time for harming Nancy because of her minor status. The fact that Jason advised Nancy to divorce Bill and get everything he was worth from him did not surprise Bill. They didn't realize that Bill was one step ahead. He knew that Nancy often allowed Jason to drive a BMW and even have intimate relations with her in the back seat. He also knew about Nancy's visit to a divorce lawyer recommended by Paul. The lawyer conducted an investigation of Bill's business and assets. After waiting a few days, he took out a second mortgage on his house to cover Lisa's tuition costs. The next day, he filed for bankruptcy. He hoped that when he was sued, Betty would change the locks on their house while they were in New York. At the barbecue party the weekend before Lisa left, we played the roles of father and daughter well. Paul and Betty were friendly as always. Paul even helped cook the meat on the grill. No one could suspect them of betrayal. On Friday morning while Nancy was in the bathroom, Bill took her phone and sent a message to Jason. The message read, I'll be at your house at 8, and I want to make love to you before I leave with them. Get permission from work and quickly return home to make love to the one that belongs to you forever. I'll let them know that I need to make some purchases. Please don't call or text me. I'll leave my cell phone at home in case they ask about my location. I look forward to seeing you soon, my future husband. Bill erased the message after it was sent and discreetly returned Nancy's phone to her purse. Jason did not know that upon entering his apartment, he would be ambushed, where he would be attacked by three men. Jason was well scared and forced to send a letter asking for his dismissal to his manager. Another letter was sent to the owner of the building, saying that he should vacate the premises by the end of the month. After drugging him, they would clean out his apartment, remove all spy cameras and take away everything of value, and then pretend that he had disappeared forever. They put him in a van and took him away. Jason's fate will remain a mystery, because he will never be seen again. Lisa and Linda did not know about Bill's actions towards Jason. He planned to keep this secret until his death. On Friday afternoon, Bill checked into a motel room after being served after watching the evening news about Paul and his unfaithful wife. Later, before dinner, a man from Jason's apartment came to Bill, who silently handed over the cameras and received the last payment. The following Saturday, Bill checked out of the motel, bought a new cell phone, and got rid of the old one. He contacted Lisa and gave her his new number, after which he went to Linda's house. There, he began editing the video, carefully hiding Jason's face to exclude the possibility of a connection between him and Jason in the event of a missing person report. During his stay in the house, he lived in the guest room and became friends with Linda's son. The last stage of Bill and Linda's plan began when his company was acquired by an elderly couple from Seattle, who turned out to be Linda's relatives. No employees were fired during the transition. When Lisa called him on Monday and told him that Nancy was trying to reach him, they laughed together. He subsequently uploaded the entire video to the website for and anonymously shared the link with everyone they knew, even Nancy's brother-in-law, using a fictitious email address. For the next three months, he stayed by Linda's side until his divorce was finalized. At this time, they continued to meet in a romantic way, although they refrained from physical intimacy. Linda has set a clear boundary. Bill will be able to publicly acknowledge their relationship only after he officially becomes a bachelor. Bill respected her wishes because he was determined to keep his marriage vows. One of the advantages of living with Linda was that she provided cover from any inquiries about his life situation. Bill could claim that he was experiencing financial difficulties and was living with his friend Linda until he could get back on his feet. Nancy did not appear at the court hearing, as a result of which the judge ruled on divorce without alimony and division of property due to the fact that Nancy's property was confiscated and Bill was experiencing financial difficulties. Nancy's lawyer did not object to this decision. When they crossed paths in the hallway, the lawyer praised Bill, calling him a smart man. Bill frowned back and walked away. His daughter's voice brought him back to reality. Yes, dear, what were you talking about? 
he asked. It's a father and daughter dance, everyone is looking at us, but you're not moving, his daughter replied. I'm sorry, princess, my thoughts were elsewhere, he confessed. Bill took his daughter's hand, spun her around, and they started dancing to the music. I need to dance with your mom, Bill told Lisa when the song ended, and I promised that my little brother would be next. Lisa smiled at her father. Bill asked Linda to dance, and then went to the bar to order a whiskey. As he sat down at his desk, his thoughts returned to the phone call he had received earlier that morning from Dr. Henry D'Souza of Dallas, Texas, about his wife's health. Confused, Bill asked, What's wrong with my wife? She's in the next room right now. It's about Nancy Thompson. Bill hadn't heard that name in five years. He sat down on the bed with a sigh. I'm all ears, doctor, he said. The psychologist explained that he was treating Nancy Thompson in the last days of her life. Bill was stunned. The last days? He asked. The doctor continued to tell the story of Nancy's life, starting with her childhood and ending with a meeting with Bill. Nancy confessed that Bill was the only man she loved until she made a mistake with a man named Jason, a mistake she deeply regrets. She talked about the divorce and the consequences it entailed. She was convinced that you knew about her affair and organized it. She accepted that by admitting she was wrong, she would lose her husband and daughter. On the day of departure, she had only $200 in her account. Feeling the need to avoid the consequences of her actions and shameful videos, she decided to leave as far away as possible. Boarding the first bus she came across, she ended up in Texas, where she got a job as a waitress at a seedy bar on Highway 20, popular with truck drivers. The owner of the bar offered her a room on the ground floor for a nominal fee, but in return used it whenever he pleased. A year later, she discovered that she was pregnant, and having no health insurance, turned to a cheap and illegal abortion clinic. The doctor who operated on her damaged her organs. A year later she began having risky sex lives with truckers, some of whom used protective gear and others did not. Unfortunately, she eventually contracted a severe sexually transmitted disease, and when she was taken to the hospital, she was diagnosed with AIDS. She has lost a lot of weight and realizes that she is dying. Her last wish is to see you before she dies. Please accept my condolences. I'm really sorry to hear that. My daughter is getting married today. I'll call you next week. Don't wait too long, Mr. Thompson. Here is my direct line number. Hey, honey, be careful, don't drink too much. You'll have to take us home later. Linda hugged her husband and kissed him lovingly. You are the best thing that has ever happened to me, darling. Bill pushed his glass aside. I will never endanger you or our son. Let's dance. A few days later, Bill called Dr. D'Souza from his office and informed him that he would not be able to come south due to a busy schedule. The doctor suggested that Bill talk to Nancy on the phone. He ordered a nurse to bring a cordless phone to Nancy's bedside in the ward. When Bill heard Nancy's faint voice on the phone, he replied simply, Yes, Nancy, it's me. It made Nancy cry. I'm really sorry, Bill. I sincerely regret my actions towards you and our family. I'm still dealing with the consequences. Nancy, I've forgiven you. I'm moving on and I'm happy. Bill took a deep breath. I have to express my gratitude to you. After the divorce, I found the most wonderful woman, and we had a son. Lisa adores her new mother and they have a great relationship. By the way, Lisa got married last Saturday. The wedding was wonderful. Lisa's mom made all the preparations. Lisa's children will definitely call her their grandmother. We've both been looking forward to this moment. Bill heard Nancy start crying. Then he heard the insistent shrill noise of medical equipment and the commotion coming from Nancy's room. He waited until he finally heard a frightened voice. Mr. Thompson, I'm Nurse Angela Smith. I'm sorry, but I have to interrupt the conversation. He looked at the family photo on his desk. A smile appeared on his face and he thought, Laughter is the best medicine.